So I'm going to start off with an iconic figure, OK? So earlier this year, Spike Lee voiced his anger that gentrification was changing New York City. And this is what he said. I'm just going to read it to you. And it's not just Fort Greene. It's not just Harlem. When I was growing up, DC used to be called Chocolate City. Now it's Vanilla Swirl. I used to go to London, hang out in Brixton. No more black people in Brixton. So gentrification, this thing, it's not just this borough, this city, this country. It's happening all over the world. And the thing everybody neglects to talk about is where do the people go that get displaced? Bottom line, where do they go? OK, so I think this went viral. Spike Lee shone the light, the light on gentrification in New York City. What I want today is shine that same light on London. So I've got one key message. And that key message is that there are alternatives. Now, why talk about this this year? 2014 is the 50th anniversary of the term gentrification. This was a term that was coined in 1964 by a British London-based sociologist called Ruth Glass. Now, there's been lots and lots of ranting about this process, but I think one of the problems are that we haven't really kind of talked about alternatives, and that's what I want to do today. The key message is that these alternatives, unlike gentrification, are economically and socially sustainable. And those are the kind of key words. Now, the types of gentrification that are affecting London are varied, as we all know. So we've got, for example, the super gentrification by the super rich. We have got hipstification, as people are calling it, by creative types. And I live in Archway, in northern tip of Islington in London. I've now got, apparently, New York City rental-style gentrification coming to my neighbourhood. So what's happening here is that the company that's taken over Archway Tower, which used to be the main DHSS office in North London, um, in many ways actually was talked about as the kind of icon of Thatcherism in punk songs and other things, it's now being privatised, converted from office to residential. And this is what the company say. They say, Archway, where I live. It deserves regeneration, and we believe our investment will be the catalyst to further gentrification in this important North London community. Oh dear, I said. But the gentrification that I think is most critical and most important at the moment is the gentrification of council estates. That is the demolition and the rebuilding of council estates as what they are calling mixed income communities. So this one here, the Haygate Estate in Elephant Castle, which is not far from here, as you can see, has been demolished and it's in the process here. Now, why? Why do I think this is the most important gentrification going on at the moment? Because I think that council estates are one of the last barriers to the almost complete gentrification of inner London. And once they've gone, we've lost. It's gone. So gentrification, then, as a process, obviously has mutated over time. When Ruth Glass was talking about gentrification in 1964, it was a very different process to today. Gentrification, as Spike Lee has said, has become a global brand. It's gone from what I want to call conspicuous thrift to conspicuous consumption. So if you think back to the kind of renovation of Victorian and Georgian houses, these early gentrifiers coming in, ripping up dirty old carpets, stripping wood floors, knocking down interior walls. You can see an example here. Opening up the living space. It was this kind of middle-class, rustic kind of aesthetic that was imported into the inner city. The gentrifiers themselves were left liberal types, subsequently became known as the new middle class. And, of course, the aesthetic itself got commodified. Habitat was one of the first companies to go on board with this kind of stripped-down version of furniture, etc., and now, of course, it's so mainstream, we just need to go to Ikea and we get the same uh, process. But the branding, the branding has become really important. So, for example, the East Village in New York City is a big brand. It's a big brand for gentrification. We've now got, if you go to the Olympic site, E20. We now have our own East Village in London, okay, with the redevelopment of the Olympic Village. So Elephant and Castle, a couple of months ago, we were going to have a Tribeca there, like in New York City, but luckily the locals reacted and the council backed down. There's Midtown Manhattan. So I walked out of Hoban Tube Station the other day, and I was like, whoa, 
all these banners flapping at me, telling me I'm in midtown London. And I was like, when did this, when did this emerge? This is new to me. In fact, this branding has become so mainstream that people are taking the piss out of it now. So if you look at sitcoms, like this US sitcom, which actually I only saw for the first time the other week, How I Met Your Mother. So these people move into this trendy up-and-coming neighbourhood in New York City called Do Wise Trey Pla, only to discover later on that it actually stands for downwind of the sewage treatment plant. <laughs> oh, the irony. So what's happened is that gentrification has become this very broad process of social and economic change. And what's happening is that the kind of white-collar, middle-class consumption habits are infiltrating and kind of expanding around our cities and pushing out anything else. And it's causing a kind of, I guess, a kind of economic, but also a kind of cultural barrier between rich and poor. And I think both of those, the economic and the cultural, are really important. Now, of course, we're here in Brixton at TEDx Brixton, and, you know, you cannot but not talk about gentrification in Brixton. So the fairy tale, Brixton has gone from riots to riches. We're now the poster child of urban regeneration in London. But I think importantly, Brixton is also on the front line as a kind of barrier against gentrification. So, for example, Rushcroft Road, which is not far from here, walking distance. Last year, there were people evicted from mansion blocks they'd been squatting for decades. People came out on the streets and people began to resist this process. Gressingham Gardens in Tulse Hill, a lovely council estate that faces Brockwell Park. I visited it earlier this year. The, the council has told them they're going to be demolished and regenerated by a private company who's going to cash in on the views over Brockwell Park. Their battle, of course, has just begun, but these battles are growing. So what I think is happening is that what Ruth Glass called an embarrass de riches, in my best French, which is not very good, has happened in London. We've become incredibly wealthy as a city and as a class in terms of where we locate ourselves. But gentrification, so everybody says, so government says, is a boost for everyone. Okay. Indeed, it's so much of a boost that it's now the cutting edge of global urban policy. The problem is... There's no labelled or kind of bounded policy on gentrification, and that's deliberate because, quite simply, gentrification is a dirty word, and governments know that. So here we have, for example, from 1985, uh, the Real Estate Board of New York City, recognising this word was so problematic, took out an advertisement in the New York Times trying to kind of praise it, to kind of, you know, mediate this kind of negative perception. Now... Governments, knowing it's a dirty word, have used neutral labels. So labels like urban regeneration, urban renaissance, urban redevelopment. But also, new labels that have this kind of liberal moral discourse attached to them. Mixed communities policy, and the one we all know about, urban sustainability. And also another one, the kind of economically feel-good term, the creative city. Now, of course, what they all have in common is that their programmes of gentrification, but they're hidden. They soft pedal programs of gentrification and they're marketed in a very particular way. So what's happened here is a kind of marketing of class change that's a positive process for cities, London, New York, but also cities worldwide now, that have a series of what they call trickle-down effects. So what they do is kind of put forward this false proposition that somehow if people mix in a neighbourhood, rich and poor, low income, high income, there'll be some kind of weird trickle-down effect where all social and cultural capital, the education, the aspirations, the manners, the behaviour of the middle classes will somehow dripple down, percolate down to the poor. Now, of course, this is a false proposition. This does not happen. The creative city idea... Creative people like you guys, like TED guys, you are the new economic saviours of cities. Your ideas, your education is going to act as a new kind of economic engine. So, of course, if you look at the branding of the old Old Street Roundabout, now as Tech City in Shoreditch, part of this is part and parcel of the same process. But I think the key point here is that gentrification is not a boost for everyone. 
despite the rhetoric, despite the propaganda. The overwhelming evidence from over now 50 years of academic and policy research on gentrification is that overall it's a negative, not a positive thing. The costs outweigh the benefits, and I think that's really important, and a lot of people don't recognise this. So, Spike Lee was asking, what happens to the people? Where do they go? Well, here we have some maps that we uh, did on displacement from the Haygate Estate in Southwark. Quite simply, when council estates are redeveloped as mixed income communities, when the middle classes are about to move in, the lower classes are moved out, they're displaced. So what you get is not social mixing. You don't get this kind of filtering process. What you get is gentrification and social segregation. So you actually get the opposite of what these policies are sold as. So why are there no alternatives on policymakers' tables? Well, I think there's two reasons. One, I think there's a real lack of creativity. And I think, secondly, that creativity needs to be taken on board by policymakers, planners, and also by people like ourselves. But the other point is that because gentrification's gone mainstream, it's become part and parcel of kind of corporate investment, et cetera, and of course they have a vested interest in selling gentrification as a positive process. So what's been done to fight this process? Well, certainly in New York City, where Spike Lee was talking about, Gentrification has been battled against for some significant time now. But I think what's really interesting now is that in London, over the last five or six years, there's a palpable increase in people recognising gentrification and trying to fight against it. So this is a picture of Tompkins Square Park riots, which took, part in the, took place in the summer of 1988 in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. The Lower East Side now is marketed as the East Village. And what happened there was that the park had a curfew imposed on it as an attempt to kind of further cleanse the area for kind of systematic progressive gentrification. What happened is the protesters arrived, and here we have our gentrification as class war banners. There was about 600 of them. As the police arrived to break it up, a, you know, riot ensued, people were hurt, and it made headline international and national news. But... This might be infamous, but I think there are actually more successful examples of resistance. So, for example, if you went to Park Slope in Brooklyn, in New York City, there's a local community group there called the Fifth Avenue Committee. In 1999, they set up what they called a displacement-free zone. The idea here was to protect low-income and medium-income tenants in their area from being evicted by landlords who are pushing up rents. So how did they do that? different ways. First of all, they used local religious leaders and utilised them to kind of push the consciences of landlords. Second, they got legal help for tenants in the courts. And third, they went out and they would perhaps protest at the landlord's home, protest at the landlord's business. But the whole idea was about bringing the landlord to the negotiating table in an attempt to try and keep these tenants, these low-income tenants, in place. And that DFZ idea, I think, is a really good one for London, particularly with the private rental gentrification and the increase in rents. But, of course, there's been stuff going on in London. So, for example, the Peeps Community Forum, which fought the gentrification of the Peeps estate in Deptford, led by Malcolm Cadman, wasn't successful in blocking gentrification completely, but it was very proactive in fighting for people to have the right to stay put and also the right to return after they'd been moved out and things had been regenerated. And they were successful in getting much better stuff built than what would have been done so if they hadn't been involved. More recently, the work that I've been involved in is with uh, a number of groups, the London Tenants Federation, just Space, who lobby the London Plan, and Southwark Notes Archive Group, which is not far from here. And what we've been trying to do is come together and do three things, really. First of all, explain to council tenants when urban regeneration is gentrification. It isn't always, but more often than not it is, so they understand that it is. Second, to give them some tools to resist. And third, and really importantly, to present some alternatives. So what are those alternatives? Well, I'll go through some of those now. 
The first thing that council estates are often told is that they're in structural disrepair and they need to be demolished. In fact, this is not true. Many council estates are structurally sound. If they are, the best thing for them to do is attempt to refurbish. To give you an example, the Haygate estate in Elephant and Castle, an architectural company, did a project there and found that you could renovate those units for £14,000 each, costing in total less than half what it costs Southwark Council just to clear people out of the estate. So refurbishment is not only cheaper, it's environmentally and socially sustainable. Now there are cases where you can't, where there is structural disrepair and you can't refurbish. But there are alternatives for that too. Community self-build. And the new national pl planning policy framework is quite clear that local councils now have to support people who want to do self-build. So communities can come together, and in many ways they can, they can kind of front up to the stranglehold that local developers have, and they could rebuild their own community. Of course, taking council estates out of the market is very important if you want to protect them against gentrification. And there are a number of different examples of models that you might be able to use. So, for example, community land trusts. The East London Community Land Trust was set up recently on the St. Clement's Hospital site on land turned over from Tower Hamlets. And what they've been able to do is construct housing that's rented out according to below local average rents rather than market rate. So they're protecting this community against the inflations that gentrification causes. Community land trusts are beginning to grow, and I think people are waking up to them. So, for example, the Andover estate in Islington is about to take over some of its estate on lease from Islington Council and create their own community land trust. And this keeps the rents at an affordable level. Another example that's useful is cooperatives. And there's been lots of cooperatives. The oldest cooperative London is the, in London is the Sanford Cooperative from 1973 in New Cross. This was a cooperative that took over a piece of wasteland from Lewisham Council and developed a block of flats and also a, a, a number of houses. And it's been really very, very successful. And you can see here from the kind of uh, media coverage on it. The advantage of this is that the people themselves are able to collectively manage their homes and they're able to set their own rents, their own costs. So you're keeping it out of the market. And finally, another good example is community housing associations. So in the 1980s, Walterton and Elgin Estates in Westminster fought off the privatisation of their homes and created a resident-controlled community housing association. Now, I think the advantages of community housing associations is they can protect tenants from transition from council to London, house, London housing associations, many of whom now have had to become developers or in their own right because of the affordability of land, etc., in London. So this is a way of avoiding that situation. What I think these things are, are powerful, people-led solutions to the problems of gentrification and displacement. So really, what I want to say today is quite simply that like New York, London needs to wake up to what's happening here. But more importantly, we need to wake up to what the alternatives are. There are very creative, people-led solutions to gentrification that not just ourselves, but planners and policymakers need to look at too. And we need to do this quickly because this social cleansing is escalating. Thank you. Thanks, TEDx.